Gracious Space Winter Edition, Day 10. The title is Slow Down. Slow down, you move too fast. You got to make the morning last now. Okay, that's Paul Simon, <laughs> my best impression. To feel groovy, you have to let yourself move slowly, savor, find a rhythm, and stick to it, meander. Home education is a trip on side streets. It's the wasted time of sleeping in and running late in questions such as, hey, where's my other shoe? It's the long, straggly gaggle of children, strollers, and backpacks making their way across a crowded, dangerous parking lot to a museum. Inside, an hour spent looking for three paintings is plenty. It leads to sidetracked conversations about unrelated subjects, and what is retained is hidden from view for years, maybe a decade. Then the whole kit and caboodle reverses course to saunter and dawdle back to the car, where the buckling, clicking, and tucking in take longer because everyone is tired and hungry. Home education means charging forward with new materials and slogging slowly through old, comfortable ones. When lightning strikes, she's reading. He finished his story. She mastered the sevens. He learned all the capitals. Celebration takes time and words and uses up treats in the toy box or refrigerator. Happiness has room to be felt and known. Personal pride is admired. Nothing more is accomplished in the basking glow of success. Homeschool means that when a child begs to be read the next chapter, we do, even if it means staying up a little later. Who can stop when everyone, including mom or dad, is so eager to know what happens next? Math is ditched when Nova is airing an episode about the migration habits of your favorite birds. All manner of family members hunker down under blankets to let the visual feast of scenes unspool at their deliberate, unhurried pace. Making muffins for tea time lasts an eternity of measuring the ingredients, struggling to stir the messy mix, and unevenly filling the cups, only to bake them and then wait, wait, wait for the wonderfully yummy end results. No one wants to read to stop reading poetry ever. So some days you don't stop and it's wonderfully okay. When the sun comes out after its long absence, kicking a soccer ball in the backyard is on task and feels right. No one misses the phonics workbook that day, yet everyone knows it's not gone forever, just for today. This one glorious long day of nothing but sunshine. Take time today to be, float, notice, hang, enjoy, savor. Homeschooling is a magnificent waste of time. It refuses to be boxed into systems, schedules, and requirements. It is the long, lazy, loving look at learning through the eyes of your children. It takes time. Time you don't have. Time you aren't used to spending in all your adult hurry. Give in. Let go. Feel groovy. Quote of the day. We spent today at a science center and I was almost about to scold myself for not doing school today. Thanks, Liz Davis. Sustaining thought. Home education is a trip on side streets. So do you feel groovy? <laughs> Can you slow down? Can you go slow to go fast? That is a mantra I have to repeat to myself almost every day. I was realizing the other day that when I actually take the time needed to open an envelope, to close a window on the computer, to find the scarf and tie it around my neck, not grab it as I'm hurrying down the stairs, that I actually have calm running through my daily experience. I've actually inhabited the experience. I have a man in my life that I spend a lot of time with and when we travel or we go outside on a hike, 
I have this really odd experience with him. You know what it is? I can remember where we were. We don't talk. We walk. We're actually on the beach experiencing the ocean and the beach when we're taking a walk. When we go to a foreign country, we walk through a museum, we look at what we see in front of our eyes. Sure, we make a comment here and there, but there's no overarching discussion that is controlling the experience. You know how sometimes you might go to the Grand Canyon and what you remember is the argument you had? Or maybe you don't remember the Grand Canyon and what you remember is this very worrying analytical conversation about one of your kids. Slowing down means actually being present to the demand of the moment, to the need of the moment, to being willing for a little bit of space to breathe around the experience, whether that comes from actually just quietly observing or allowing some boredom or a little bit of time for everyone to adjust to a different pace. We're so used to hurrying and rushing and imagining what comes next that it's really hard to inhabit what is now. I know when I first started the Poetry Tea Time experience, it was tempting to want to make it last or to feel like I did all this work and they were only interested for 15 minutes. And then I remembered something as I experienced it. It takes time to get used to new routines. It takes time to appreciate poetry. On that very first excursion where you spend all this energy making the muffins and the tea, maybe everyone only sits still to eat one muffin and listen to one poem. But how can you go from zero poems in a child's life to an hour of enjoyable poetry reading in one step? We expect too much, we demand too much of our experiences. What if we could just be with that opportunity and a chance to introduce, to make the acquaintance. You know, when you meet someone new, you run out of things to talk about because you don't know each other very well yet. You can't ask all around the corners of their lives. The same is true with a subject. Before you have familiarity with math or poetry or phonics, the conversations are brief. Know what I mean? They're short. You can only sustain engagement for a brief amount of time. But that brief amount of time, fully attended to, appreciated and let go, creates a second chance encounter that is positive, that is anticipated. And maybe that experience will grow. It's one reason that when I tell parents you can literally teach writing by doing one free write a week and starting with three minutes that it's actually enough for the whole week because you're making an introduction. You're giving your children a chance to get to know the shape of her body and what the sound of her voice is like and why her hair does that weird woo-hoo thing, right? You want your children to have the ability to enter and retreat, to make the acquaintance and then to have time away while they process that acquaintance. We don't have to cover so much information in order to prove that we've made a connection. If you can almost think of yourself as the Tinder app, <laughs> the dating app of education, that would be a great metaphor for you. When you present something to your child, are they gonna swipe right or swipe left on you? Are they gonna be interested in that second encounter, going out for the coffee date? Or are they going to simply swipe by because the first impression was poor, not good. Our job is to create space for that first encounter to be positive, to be something that might lure them into a deeper acquaintance. And then when we see that deeper acquaintance take hold, to be okay with it actually taking time. It's so funny how when a child finally catches fire with reading and wants to read through the whole, you know, Narnia series in a row, a parent is suddenly like, well, they're spending too much time reading. And yet their secret desire was for that child to take off with reading. But once they are fully immersed in it, we're like, but what about math? <laughs> you know what I mean? Slow down. 
allow the fire lit within to burn a full blaze. Trust me, it will eventually go to embers. It will go to the warm coals. But if you blow it out before it really gets going, if you continually keep starting new little brush fires, they have to keep moving their camp chair. <laughs> you know, they're just starting to get that marshmallow roasted and you're like, over here, over here, put that one down. That's not very satisfying. We want our children to experience the full catalyst from within and to know the power of their own intellectual hunger. And they only get to experience that if we slow down. That means some of our time that we have allocated for this very important subject may not get used. We might have to set aside something we think is really important for the current obsession or fascination so that the child gets to have the joy and pleasure of being catalyzed from within. That's what it means to learn. And what makes homeschool so fabulous is you aren't working through these seven hours perfectly, you know, bifurcated, <laughs> bisected into these segments of the day. Instead, you really can, like an accordion, expand for the subject of true fascination, and then you can contract for those that are just new, just barely making the acquaintance, just starting to create a little spark. And both can be done with a deliberate conscientiousness, not with this desperation to get through, get done, check off the list. There is so much more time than you realize in homeschool. So much what is happening around the margins is your homeschool. Whether you're driving to the orthodontist, having a great conversation like Jeanette reminded us this morning at our staff meeting, or you are sitting with a child over a specific course of study learning Latin. Both have value and one isn't superior to the other. They both contribute to the overall experience of learning. And we want our kids to learn in a variety of ways. We want them to be good at the conversation and good at parsing a verb in a foreign language. And sometimes that really does seem like a rote procedure, but it is different than doing it to the child. We want to find a way into Latin or into French or into math that stimulates curiosity and connection that goes beyond just fulfilling the assignments. Does that make sense? So slow down. The groove of your homeschool is established when you can recognize the difference between deep dive immersive learning and introductions. When you can see for yourself that some subjects benefit from clearing the schedule, and others benefit from adding a treat. Figuring out how to be with your child around a subject is your job. That is your chief mission as a home educator. It's not to force them to get things done. It's to create a feast of ideas that is so rich and attractive, you'll get around to all of them because they are all valuable, not one more than the other. Now, I know some of you are saying, but my child will never be interested in math, or she really hates foreign language, or I cannot seem to successfully engage grammar. So here's my advice to you. Slow down. You find out what's interesting about math. If math for your whole life has been this mental block, this wall for you, well, now's your opportunity to find out why math is interesting. That should be your task before you ever research curriculum. Find out why the subject that right now is opaque to you is actually fascinating. Start there. And then use that journey to your advantage with your children. Share your own frustration, reluctance, struggle, Explore the subject using tools that are unfamiliar and ideas that are new to you. Give yourself a chance 
to be the actual role model of what it means to learn that you are expecting to see in your kids. You know, we're so in teacher mode. We're so in I'm the expert adult mode. But what would it look like to just cop to it? I've shared this story before, but I'll share it again now in case you haven't heard it. So when Noah was in fourth grade and it was time to learn fractions, I realized I did not remember how to find a common denominator. I had no idea. Could not for the life of me think of it in my own brain. So we had, you know, four kids, five kids by then crawling around the living room. And I said, you know, older two children, watch the younger three, keep everyone alive. I'll be right back. And I took the math book and I went into the garage and I started following the directions and figuring out how to do this common denominator thing. And because I was in my 30s and I had a lifetime of experiences of dealing with numbers, I suddenly got it very quickly. It didn't take me long, but I was away from the children in the garage, California, we don't have basements, and I was figuring out how to find common denominators. So I popped back in the house. I said, Noah, I'm ready to teach you. And just remember, I left the house. I didn't want him to see that I didn't know how. I was hiding from my children in the garage with the book trying to figure this out so that when I come back, I can look like the teacher who knows. Have any of you done that? I thought this would be lost on my child. I was under the misimpression that they would be fooled <laughs> by this exit <laughs> and return. So I sat down and I showed Noah how to do it and he caught on instantly because he's quite bright and numbers come pretty easily to him. And he did the whole page perfectly. We got to the end and he turned to me and this is what he said. So mom, um, just to be clear, I only need to know fractions in fourth grade and never again until I'm a parent teaching them. <laughs> Unmasked. Total emperor has no clothes moment for the teacher, for me. And I said, you know, Noah, it is one of my great losses in life that math has not come easily to me and I have not successfully mastered basic math principles. In fact, what's happening for me while I home educate you is for the first time in my life, I'm fully understanding math concepts that I've never kind of grasped. So you're exactly right. I did not understand how to do this, but look at it. it only took me a couple minutes in the garage. And what's really amazing is if you make friends with math, it could serve you the rest of your life. I said some version of that. And you know what? Today he's a computer programmer. And you know what? Math has been his favorite subject. Even with a mother who was terrible at math, he found a way to relate to it that became meaningful to him. And it's his favorite thing. He does Khan Academy stuff all the time because it's pleasurable. Are you kidding me? So you don't even have to be great at the subject. You don't even have to know it. You don't have to secretly hide in the basement or the garage. You don't have to pretend that you know. You can be a learner in front of your children and still invite them into the experience of the adventure of learning that subject. And you can cop to it. I mean, after all, someone like me who was raised in the public schools, isn't it a fascinating thing for your child to see that that school education they're not getting failed you? After all, that helps them understand maybe why you want to homeschool them. All of this is learning. And you can do it by slowing down. Not hurrying and scurrying through the day, forcing subjects together, creating this hierarchy of importance. That will gut you it will make your homeschool feel like it is burdened and heavy and hard to carry. And your children will sense that and they will not want to carry it with you. They will want to back away <laughs> and resist the heaviness. I mean, really, you know, think about it. You wake up, I'm going to give you a great analogy. You wake up on a Saturday morning, you've had a really long week. Maybe you're still nursing a baby at night. Maybe you have a bed wetter. Maybe it, you just stayed up too late binge watching your favorite shows because finally the kids were in bed and it was just so nice to stay up with Netflix. So Saturday morning comes and you're just really ready to sleep in. 
and all of a sudden your spouse, the person you love that you've chosen to spend your life with, wakes up in a great mood and says, today we are going to clean the garage and then immediately has tasks for everyone. And it's an unrealistic project. The garage has floor to ceiling stuff that's been packed there forever. It's the fall, you're supposed to be raking leaves, you're supposed to be washing laundry, it's your day to go shopping without the baby. But now suddenly your whole life is being taken over by these processes that you have to care about because this other person is telling you what to do. You know that feeling? That's what we do to our kids. Now, it's not to say the garage doesn't need to be cleaned, but wouldn't it be great to understand the necessity, the value, to space it out, to talk about when the best time is to tackle various tasks, to be cooperative and collaborative. Our tendency, when we feel guilt-ridden, is to load up. It's to add, it's to increase, it's to double down. It's rarely to let go. And my suggestion this morning is that when you start to feel that panic well up, go the opposite. Just go the opposite direction. Slow down. Let go. Pause. Make introductions. Create space for the deep dive. Collaborate. Be cooperative. Sprinkle some pixie dust over the day. Enchant the space a little. A candle, a brownie, beautiful music, a moment outside where everybody does jumping jacks and breathes the fresh air, a couple of yoga moves, tickling, telling a joke, reading a poem, spontaneously dancing in the kitchen, cleaning up one room, not all seven, finding the video you haven't watched yet and popping it in. That's what I'm talking about. And then from that space of feeling re-energized and connected and open to the world of ideas, you, I promise, will find meaningful connections for every subject you care about. They're all there waiting for you. They're not going anywhere. They're connected to everything you already know about life. You can trip over them no matter what you're doing why is the electric kettle boiling water faster than on a stove? That's a science question, a math question, and a food question. Why does this poem rhyme and this poem doesn't? Math question, literature question, aesthetic question. Literally, you are tripping over learning every moment of the day. And if you slow down, those learning opportunities are going to start popping right in your imagination, right in front of your eyes. Isn't that amazing? I remember when I was teaching my kids to tell time, we had one of those fake clocks. You know, it was like um, a cardboard cutout and it had the hands on it that you could move. And it suddenly dawned on me, that was such a schoolish thing to have like the cardboard. We literally had a clock whose hands you could move that we bought at Target that was really pretty. And it had a battery and you could put the battery in or take the battery out. And it suddenly led to what is a clock, not just how to tell time. Do you know what I'm saying? So focused on telling time. And then crazy thing is my kids didn't ever really learn the hand style because everywhere they looked, clocks were digital. They were digital. They could read the numbers. Why did they really have to learn the hands? So I made sure we had some hand clocks around the house so they could be bilingual in clock time telling, right? Because that's an easier way to learn than sitting there with this artificial cardboard hand clock that doesn't even look like the ones they see anywhere. We want to start making connections and asking real connections. Get out of this teacher mode, out of this mindset that you have important information to get them to learn and start learning. One of the best places to start is to hold the book in question and look at the first page, whatever that workbook or textbook is asking and say to yourself, 
Is this interesting to me? Don't ask if it's interesting to your child or if it's a good tool or if it's effective. Just ask, is this interesting to me? If it's not interesting yet, that's your task. Start thinking about what makes this interesting, okay? Even if it's just for you, your kids may still be disinterested, but I want you to get back in touch with what creates interesting. Where does that come from? What draws you forward? Why are you homeschooling? There's something about it that hooked your interest. What was it? What was it? How did it hook your imagination? How did it reel you in? <laughs> no one held a gun to your head. In fact, most people would say you're crazy for doing it. 24-7 with your kids, no specific teacher training, no way to measure your progress, no certain outcome. So why the heck would you do this? You could send them off to school and have lunch with friends and play tennis, like my mother did. <laughs> I used to think that's what all adults did. I didn't know that wasn't the case. <laughs> you could be doing that, but you didn't. So why is it interesting? Start asking the question. What makes this interesting? What is interesting about this? If it's not interesting to you, how do you think your kids are gonna discover it to be interesting? And is duty really our highest goal with educating our children just because it has to be done? Is that our highest value around learning? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure that's not why you homeschool. Because if it was all about duty, just stick them in the schools. At least those teachers are trying to make their classrooms an interesting place to be, most of them. And they're not always succeeding, but that is the objective. Okay? So, to re recall, recap, that's the word I'm looking for. Slow down. Slow down. Ask the questions about learning that help you advance your goals. Be interested in your children's experience. Sometimes shrink the experience to a short introduction. Other times, like an accordion, expand to deep dive, to really hear all the music, to focus and allow other things that you value to go to the side temporarily. It's not forever. When you see a skill or a passion around learning catch fire, allow that fire to live its full course. Let it burn itself out. Don't feel like it's your job to stop the child and move them over to this other subject because they're too into it. It's great to want to finish the whole math book in a weekend or read the whole series back to back or to just do kitchen chemistry experiments for the next three weeks. So much learning happens when you have the child's full imagination engaged. Allow it to occur. Slow down. If you give in to that, you make so much time later for the things that you also want them to learn. Because now they've had the experience of being catalyzed from within. And they will look for that hook in the next thing you introduce. And they will trust you. That you want them to have a happy life. That your life isn't about putting out fires, but lighting them. Okay? I hope you have a fabulous day today. I am going to, one more time, run through some information. What we listened to today came from my book, A Gracious Face Winter. You can buy it if you want it by the link that's part of this video. There are free, uh, five free downloadable days to read that you can go pick up by clicking on that link. So we'd love you to do that. In the Homeschool Alliance, my coaching community, we are studying history and talking about how we can engage the mindset that makes history come to life for kids. Stephanie Elms and I, the coaches in CoachJulieBogart.com, are there to talk with you. We do readings from a gracious space live, and we do webinars where we actually study the content of the month's readings. Hey, Angie, she's the one who hosted us in LA last weekend. Lovely to see you here. Finally, today we launched a brand new Brave Writer product called the Boomerang Early English Collection. It features six early English literature titles, 
and we have designed literature guides to go with them that have copy work and dictation passages, some think piece questions, and a little introduction to each book. If you are looking for a high school level boomerang product, I highly recommend this collection. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope I see many of you in the Homeschool Alliance. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., we will be reading day 11, and on Thursday, day 12. So if you love these readings and you want more of them with more intimacy, join the Alliance. All right, everybody, have a fabulous day. Mwah.